to Municipal Affairs. I'm Christopher Brown. Today, we have a special guest on the show, Kyle Kazowski, the Alberta NDP's Municipal Affairs Critic and MLA for Sherwood Park, who will help us unpack the implications of several recent legislative moves by the United Conservative Party government. Earlier this week, Premier Daniel Smith and the UCP passed Bill 18, 20, and 21, all of which have been under fire for a series of legislative actions that critics argue centralize power and undermine the democratic process municipally. Bills 18, 20, and 21 have sparked significant debate and concern across the province. These bills include measures that allow the provincial government to remove democratically elected municipal leaders, overrule local bylaws, and assume control over the Local Emergencies Act. Kazowski, in a recent op-ed article published in the Sherwood Park News, has been vocal about what he perceives as a blatant power grab by the UCP. He points out the critical timing of these legislative changes, noting that May is traditionally a challenging month for Alberta due to the natural disasters such as fires, floods, and extreme weather events. So join us as we discuss with the MLA the impacts of these bills on local governance in Alberta, the implications for democratic accountability, and the broader political context in which these changes are occurring, and what he has heard from municipal leaders, both urban and rural. This is Municipal Affairs. Kyle, thank you so much for doing this and taking time out of your busy schedule to sit down with me and talk about sort of the last month, it seems like, in the world of municipal affairs. Uh, this government uh, under Daniel Smith and the Honorable Rick McIver introduced Bill 18, 20, 21, 22, which uh, both Alberta municipalities and the rural municipalities of Alberta seem concerned about, to say the least. It literally, as of recording this, it was they were passed this week in the Legislative Assembly. Uh, from the Alberta NDP standpoint, how's the last month and a half been and how did we get here, do you think? Yeah, and you really highlighted the trifecta of, uh, of Bill 20, uh, the suite of, of bills that are uh, have been brought in that really undermined the, uh, the municipal governments uh, in Alberta. And so how we get here or got here is is interesting, just that there there was no political mandate uh, for this government a year ago. We're uh, we're on the one year anniversary of uh, of the last election. Uh, so that campaign is fresh enough in my mind to remember we didn't we didn't talk about about uh, changes to the Municipal Governance Act or the uh, Local Governance Elections Act. And so so it was a bit of a surprise that we were dealing with this. Now, the. The government did give some foreshadowing that they were considering bringing political parties into municipal government. And so we had uh, developed our position on that, which is we're opposed to that. And we can get into that a little bit uh, more. But then the uh, the legislation came forward, which was really an omnibus, omnibus bill with, uh, with a great deal of changes to how municipal governments are going to operate in uh, Alberta and how the next election is going to feel to to voters, and so we've uh, we've been through a lot in the last uh, uh, month with our debate, and I think you know what was interesting that came through this is they had no mandate to to bring this in, but what was even more surprising is they did no consultation. There was not a big city mayor, there was not a, a head of a stakeholder association like the RMA or Alberta municipalities that had any idea of what legislation was coming forward. And so no consultation was done. And so opposition uh, was pretty fierce because the changes to uh, to municipalities and how they're gonna operate um, is gonna be very significant. And so then there was no debate, was I guess the last piece to add to that, Chris, that uh, we had legislation that's very, very sweeping uh, changes to, to municipal government here. That would have been great to to talk about because there's a lot of changes that have been made uh, to to the municipal statutes, and there was one hour of debate in the legislature on on each of them on one on one hour on Bill 18, one hour on Bill 20, and one hour on Bill 21, and uh, it it was shocking and surprising, especially as a new uh, new legislator or someone that's that's new to this and ready to debate this to find out that. That we weren't going to even start the discussion before we, you know, they would introduce the bill and they'd say make the next motion would be let's uh, let's limit debate to one hour. Like it was it was very surprising. And I think just I'm going on a little bit. But what was interesting about that was we we discovered since the UCP became government, they have uh, limited debate 
50 times and and shut it down and not after not after 17 hours of debate with the with maybe someone like myself and the opposition bringing forward uh points and uh but before we've even started discussion they said let's not let's not talk about this too long let's just get it done with Let's talk about this last week because uh, yourself, uh, because I watched the proceedings, because I take a keen interest in this type of stuff, um, you, yourself, along with the Alberta NDP, proposed amendments to Bill 20, Bill 18, to try to, in your words, make it better and sort of uh, give the uh, government party some potential wins here. And I'm using that in the respectful way. You didn't use those words, but but you asked for amendments to the bills. Um why? Where did your amendments come from? Because the government will say they proposed amendments from hearing from their consultations, but you proposed amendments. Where did your amendments come from? Did you consult with RMA, Alberta municipalities, stakeholders? Yeah, lots of great conversations with Alberta municipalities and with the Rural Municipalities Association. And so that's really what drove those amendments. We we got those from the municipalities the um and and from their stakeholder groups so political parties we 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 suggested that we we take political parties um out of the next municipal election and so that was one of the amendments uh that we brought forward and there's there's lots to to back up why that's not a good thing and i think that's what really yeah well what's really important there i think is the government really focused on the election and how you know maybe there is uh um uh, there's a feel or a sense that in municipal elections, there are, are partisan actors or parties that are already kind of um, operating during the election. And that's one thing to focus on. But the opposition and what the New Democrats were really troubled by is how it's going to change council. Because, because it's you know one thing to get elected and people know maybe you're progressive or maybe you're conservative or whatever your, 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 your party group is. Now you're on council, you got to work together with everybody. And that's one of the beautiful things and wonderful things about council decision making, especially when you think about what councils are working on. They're working on really nonpartisan issues like uh, infrastructure, um, wastewater, water treatment, uh, um, and, 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 and development of, of the, the buildings and the, and the land use in their area. So pretty nonpartisan things, which is great when we have a council decision-making process to kind of go through that and then come up with our decisions. Uh, and I'm really uh, worried about, about how council decisions will be made when there are parties. And I've talked to people that were administrators, uh, chief administrative officers in Vancouver, uh, and they said it, it dramatically changes how council decisions are made. It even changes how administration interacts with council. And I think that's a really important thing to bring up because bringing forward parties into our cities. And then later on down the road, if it works in the cities, looking at the mid-sized cities or uh, towns is not gonna be a helpful way to make sure we have good governance at the municipal level in Alberta. Do you take do you take concern that there's been talks on social media or even through stakeholders that I've engaged with that this is a direct aim at Edmonton and Calgary because traditionally those don't vote conservative. So this is a way that this government is trying to get a conservative voice in the mayor's chair. Was this a concern or did you hear that there was concern around that potential tactic that this government might be taking? Yeah, I am worried that they're trying to make uh, municipal councils the farm teams of the, the provincial government. Um, it, it can play both ways, though, on on that side of things. Um, there, are, there are effective political strategists on all sides of the spectrum that, you know, are, are chomping at the bit to run in more elections and run more, more party uh, slates. But for, for Mark, when we step back from, you know, the, again, and the campaign side of it, the governance side of it, this weakens it and makes it, uh, uh, it makes it something that isn't, we, isn't something that's going to be helpful, I think, or something that we want in Alberta. And I think when you go even to the voters, I think this the data is like 81% of Albertans are opposed to having parties in municipal government. Like I, the, so your concern that you brought up that this is the provincial government being annoyed with uh, progressive councils, I think is valid. Uh, I think that is part of the driver of this. Um, but I think you get unintended consequences sometimes when you bring forward bad legislation. Bill 21, 
they have passed so this is good this is coming as much as people uh may not think it's gonna be tomorrow it's gonna come and they're going to be implemented but after giving royal assent rma paul mclaughlin has said that this government has basically trampled over uh rural municipal uh authority and autonomy with bill 21 with the changes to the bylaws with the changes to uh repealing and amending through a bill 20 as well whether it be through local uh, emergencies that the province can step in paul mclaughlin has said that this government has, has done something that no other government has done in his time in elected office when you've been talking with more rural municipal leaders, are you getting a sense that they're not happy with this current government, with these bills that have been now passed? Oh, yeah. Not, not happy is a is a very uh, kind way of saying it. Uh, and I think what's interesting is they feel betrayed. Uh, I'm a realist. When I, when I meet with uh, rural municipal councils, it's not uncommon to uh, meet with a councillor of a county who will talk to me about how... Uh, the premier is a good friend of theirs uh, and they, you know, they have, a, they have her cell phone and uh, they can connect in, a, a, with her. Um, so, so this has been a huge surprise to them because they don't know why the provincial government is trying to undermine their decision-making. Uh, so they're quite unhappy with it. They feel quite betrayed. It's, that's a realistic way to kind of Put it because they're probably people that would identify at a provincial level or a federal level as conservatives, and uh, they're quite unhappy with 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 how the provincial government has has brought this legislation forward without consultation, and then have had limited debate because they were they were providing us with a lot of great ideas of things we should be bringing up in debate, and there just wasn't time in the legislature to to raise these things with with the government. Did did anyone on the government side give you any indication of why they were limiting debate, or was this uh, sort of taken back even for yourself? Because traditionally in our legislative democracy, because I'm one of those nerds who likes this, government house leaders get together, they debate these type of things, and they sort of look at the agenda for the week. From your perspective, did you get any prior warning that this was going to be limited to one hour debate for each three, or was this kind of surprising for yourself as well it was surprising and to even back up a little bit chris just to to give some indication of 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 some of the other things that have been i think a bit surprised for me like so this is one of the first uh these bills or, or some of the first ones where i got the bill brief so you can imagine a uh, legislation is brought forward and then uh some staff uh you know take some time and go through the bill to make sure that the the opposition has a, a good idea of what's being done because when you actually when you look at a bill sometimes um there's just you have to have a, some some context so they're there to provide context they gave us um um first off they don't tell us until the day that a bill is going to come in whether it's going to come in they don't tell us what's going to be in it after they've introduced the bill then they provide a bill briefing and you can i was a little startled it was a half hour meeting to go over a 64 page bill that is really transformative i had to slow down the bureaucracy the bureaucrats because I, I like look you're changing our democracy here and you're talking very quickly. And uh, it would be great if I just had a moment to try and really absorb what you're trying to pass all, along. So there's been some surprises here on the uh, how undemocratic even the activity around the provincial legislature has been. In a op-ed that you published in the Sherwood Park News, you 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 have come out and said these bills are a power grab by this uh, this government, by Premier Smith, and even this cabinet. That's big words. That how how did you come to that conclusion? Yeah, well, I mean, it was a lot. I I even went a little bit further, Chris. I think these are authoritarian moves because it, it is true the provincial government has the power, but if. Before this legislation, if uh, if cabinet had just decided to fire the mayor of Edmonton, there would be there'd probably be some political blowback and outrage, because they don't have the authority really to do that. And and that's an important thing to be seeing that difference between power and authority. Now with this legislation coming in, every provincial government is going to say, well, of course we have the authority to, you know, dismiss a councillor if uh, if they're 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 what are the words exactly they use. Um, uh, they're they're they, political. They're political. Uh, what, it's, I, it's not in I'm the public cut. interest. If it's there not in go. the public interest, if they're operating not in the public interest, whatever I guess that means to the government of the day. I mean, that is a that's a a massive amount of 
of power. And now they're saying we have this authority. We don't think it's in the public interest. They're not really operating in the public interest anymore. I mean, um, that is centralizing power to cabinet. And we have to always remember that cabinet decisions, unlike council meetings, cabinet meetings are are, are privileged, meaning they're they're in private uh, and they don't go to the public. There's not there's no mandate to give a report. Um, so currently they have the power and they have an investigative process. And, and in that investigative report process, if that's publicly available, at the end, the minister says, you know what, looks like this counselor's, you know, does some things that really they should be removed. Then they go through that kind of difficult decision. Um, and and so this this is going to change things and, and it makes Alberta more authoritarian. In, Tyler, in that- Gandum, Tyler Gandum, president of Alberta municipalities, even said that this, this is basically creating a back room process for a lot of uh, potential ousters of municipal leaders who they don't agree with even potentially himself and he said that on the show so i'm not saying anything out of turns here um the ndp over the last few weeks have saying everywhere every everything everywhere all at once is sort of the colloquial term to these bills um do you think there's potentially more coming down the pipeline well, I do. I do worry about the rules that have been brought forward uh, in in the in the municipal election changes and how that might uh, go forward into provincial. Um, the, so you're talking about the financing, I'm assuming. Yeah, yeah, and 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 the financing of this part is a, a pretty big change. Like, I appreciate that you know provincially uh, and federally, and up until now municipally. You, you can't contribute financially to a candidate or a campaign unless you're a voter. So, you know, I have friends in British Columbia and Saskatchewan and Ontario that when they found out I was running in Alberta, they were like, I'd like to, I'd like to contribute, Kyle. And I was like, really appreciate your support. Can't accept your donation. You don't live in Alberta. You're not going to vote here. So that's a rule that exists. And then in, in municipal elections, we're now going to allow that corporations can, can, donate up to five thousand dollars uh, so you can imagine uh how that can be used by maybe a business in ontario is like you know what i'd like to i'd like to do some land development in uh in spruce grove i just if we could just get some land use changes you know i think if we can get the right council in place then we could possibly uh you know move our bit our operations and businesses out to on uh, uh, alberta and so it's easy enough to see how uh, money from outside of alberta is going to come into Alberta for municipal elections. I, I very opposed to that, and I think the the amounts, the limits are, are 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 pretty high. Most people don't to even many municipal councils to get elected. You, it's usually self funded, and uh, you don't need to um, you don't really need to to spend five thousand dollars for the election. I think the other thing that is sort of outside of maybe the focus of most of your listeners is this applies to school boards as well. And so there is some concern. Yeah. There is some concern that, that school boards could be, uh, could be taken over um, by, by slates or parties as well. During your consultation that you did, that you had when over the last month and a half prior to where we are today, did you hear anything from any municipal leader, whether it be rural or even urban around some of the things that they actually like about this bill, these bills, or was it a complete full blanket? No, we are opposed to all three bills as is, or was it all bad? Yeah, I, I, I kind of framed it in the Clint Eastwood movie, the good, the bad and the ugly, because it's a nice, nice framework really has nothing to do with spaghetti Westerns, but you know uh, there's good in here. And so that's okay. Having and, and good that, that the that the new Democrats we think is good. Uh, that municipal leaders and and stakeholder groups like Alberta municipalities think, yeah, that's good. Like, should should the qualifications for running for council um, should those be clear before you run for council? If it's also the same things that would get you disqualified, yeah, that that's a good idea. Um, it, I mean, most councils are already doing this, but having an orientation as a new councilor, as 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 the as the law. Also, I think that's a that's a that's a good direction uh, to go with. Um, there's some rules now about recounting that if it's in half a percent, also that's good. Let's just put some framework about when is it 
you know, if it's a close election, when do we recount? That That's a good one. Uh, then we get into the bad, which I'll just describe as like, where did this come from? Is uh, the ban on and prohib prohibition on voting machines and vote ta electronic tabulators? Like that's coming from straight conspiracy. Um, the, our, our, our municipal elections have a high level of integrity. After the last municipal election, there was no scandal, no question of the outcomes that I can recall. Uh, uh, and so then people that watch too much Fox uh, News entertainment out of the United States have decided that we we can't trust voting machines. I mean, I had some great anecdotes from municipalities about how voting machines helped them with COVID. You know, they had a drive through voting uh, booth in Cold Lake, which they couldn't have done, uh, except that they had electronic uh, tabulators. Um, and so now there's going to be this cost and this requirement to try and recruit uh uh, people to work elections that we're, we were able to do before. Uh, there's cost. Some municipalities have actually bought the machines. Some of them, you know, uh, lease them from the the vendors. There's that's a mess. Uh, that's in the bad category. And then back to the ugly. It's the stuff that we've really already talked about, like the ability to uh, overturn and uh, and amend bylaws um, that aren't provincial priorities. Uh, and the ability to remove counselors or trigger um, a referendum on a counselor um, if it's in the public interest, according to cabinet. Um, last year, literally a year ago, the Alberta municipalities and RMA both launched two different uh, campaigns during the provincial election. Alberta municipalities was uh, think local vote. I'm sorry, think Alberta vote local, and while uh, RMA launched their uniquely rural. Um, Neither one of those campaigns talked about these issues. One of the things that they did talk about, both both of those campaigns talked about infrastructure. Now, I've sat down with numerous municipal leaders from across this province on this show, and they often talk to me about infrastructure. I was just talking to the mayor of Vermilion prior to this recording, and he talked about a $7 million sewage upgrade that he doesn't know where the money is going to come from because he can't do it on the backs of the, the, uh, the residents of his community. Is this taking away from the critical issues that we need to be talking about municipally at a provincial level? Well, it definitely has. Uh, I don't know if that was the intention or not. Uh, I feel the intention was a, a, a power grab, um, but we're not talking about infrastructure funding. <laughs> that's true. So, and that's a big thing. I mean, when you talk to municipal councillors about what is top of mind for them, infrastructure funding, where are they going to get it from? And those amounts are a big part of it. Um, having, feeling support is another big part. Local, local councils are feeling a lot of heat uh, from, um, from activist uh, uh, groups that uh, is, 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 is quite new. Um, and, and some of it's really unkind and undecent. Um, and I think some of the, when I've been to some previous events, um, you know, having, uh, having, having, rules around and, and guidelines around like uh, council code of conduct was actually considered a really good thing um, because we just wanted to make sure we have that kind of decency in our discussions about things like land use and infrastructure spending. Um, so, you know, for what comes forward, you know, now that this legislation has been rammed through the legislature, uh, and we'll get royal assent, we, you know, that will probably be those, those topics are going to come find their way back to top of mind and top of topic for uh, for people. And it, that's an important thing too, because we have a lot of work to do, especially in a growing province where, where municipalities are, you know, stuck with, like you said, the, with Vermillion, a $7 million uh, project that they don't know how they're going to fund. I appreciate that. I want to turn to my last question before I ask you sort of a side question, if you don't mind, because I think you're ready for it. But um we are now in the summer recess. You are not going back to the legislature until potentially October, unless the re, uh, legislature gets recalled, if I'm not mistaken. Correct me if I'm wrong there. You're, you're I, correct. I, yeah. I believe that's the calendar. Um, that means that you and your fellow MLAs will be crisscrossing this province, speaking to stakeholders, speaking to Albertans about the issues that are important to them. What do you hope as municipal affairs critic? Uh, to do over the next few months in your role to help address and talk to some of these uh, municipal leaders and see what their issues are. What's your big plan? 
Well, it, we're, and we're mapping that out. It's interesting. In Alberta, a lot revolves around uh, the stampede now. And before I was elected, I didn't realize <laughs> how much and how important and how valuable that time is. But we'll be having a lot of meetings with municipal leaders uh, at stampede because we'll all be there. And, and we want to, you know, we want to make sure that we're we're hearing their, about their priorities. And there is there's interesting challenges depending on the municipality. So um, we'll be meeting at Stampede. Uh, I'll be doing some tour of local council uh, and, and local municipalities uh, around Alberta. So that kind of stuff, like, I don't know if we're going to get all the way up to Flair and, and all the way down to... Uh, to um, horse Alberta, but we're gonna we're gonna be be meeting a lot of uh, municipal leaders uh, in their councils, uh, chambers, and in their communities. So that's an important part. You know what I'm hearing? Uh, it's it's kind of an interesting thing. Uh, some of the way the government has framed Bill 18, Bill 20, Bill 21 is stay in your lane, municipal leaders, and they, they're so frustrated by that because. They want the provincial government to step up. They find they are they're they're finding ways to try and attract doctors to their communities. They're trying to find ways to to make sure that uh, you know primary health care is affordable, so that the rent is a isn't uh, prohibitive for for local doctors and nurse practitioners. Um, they're stepping in in uh, in medical calls and and uh, drug poisonings to try and and keep the population healthy. And so they're doing things that they won't, they, they know is provincial jurisdiction because the province isn't doing it. Um, the province just wants to step in and you know again like I, I that's why we keep I, I say they're trying to control everything everywhere all at once. But with that control and authority comes a ton of responsibility and. I think we love them, you know, this UCP government to take responsibility for things like healthcare and public education. I want to ask one last question, and it's off the topic of municipal affairs. Rachel Notley gave her final address in the Legislative Assembly. Later on in June, uh, a new leader will be chosen to elect, to lead the Alberta NDP after 10 years of Rachel Notley's leadership. What was Rachel Notley meant? What did Rachel Notley mean to you? Oh, you keep uh, you keep the surprise <laughs> questions. Hey, uh, you know, uh, the first time I got in, involved in uh, in anything uh, partisan or political was was a get out the vote volunteer uh, for Rachel Notley's 2008 election. Uh, this person, this woman is been an incredible leader in this province. Um, she has has been, I think, I think for me, I mean, she's been a motivator for running. Uh, it, to be able to work with a leader like her. Um, and so, I mean, I think she's done great work and great service to our province. So what she means to me personally is I think she's an amazing person. And I and I think she's still young and got lots of energy. And I, I know she's going to be doing uh, great things. Um, and it's been, I think, one of the most interesting things is, is she's been able to control her departure. And it's been such a you know what a what a gift she's given to all progressives in Alberta because now we have the highest membership we've ever had. We have the most engaged uh, group of supporters we've ever had. We have, I think, a caucus of thirty eight MLAs that I just got to tell you, Chris, like coming to work with these people is like no exaggeration, incredible. These are just individuals that I'm just daily they impress me, and to be able to work with them. And knowing that that Rachel has grown the party to the state, you know, the state where we have um, such good MLAs, uh, such strong people that are are working. I mean, you know, a lot of credit to her and, and gratitude uh, to her for what she's given us. Thanks so much for tuning in for another great episode of Municipal Affairs with Chris Brown. If you've enjoyed today's episode, hit that subscribe button now. Next week, we're going to be covering a lot of things that are going on federally, and we're going to be talking to a few federal stakeholders, whether that be the Federation of Canadian Municipalities or even a senator from beautiful Alberta. So please hit that subscribe button as you will not want to miss next week's episode's prior to the Federation of Canadian Municipalities meeting here in beautiful Calgary, Alberta, for their annual convention where they'll be discussing issues that are prominent across this great country. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website or in the show notes below. Become a monthly subscriber like Cody from Saskatchewan, who has generously gave us money to help continue to keep this show on the air to make sure that 
municipal issues are important from coast to coast to coast. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, and as always, just keep talking.